Thank you, Master. Good evening, y'all. My name is Harold, and I'm an alcoholic. And it's by the grace of God and the fellowship I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous had been necessary for me to have a drink of alcohol since February 1970. I take no credit for that. I had the extraordinary good fortune to walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I sat down. And I took advantage of everything that was being given away. My home group is the Monday Night Back to Basics group in Annapolis, Maryland, <coughs> which everyone knows is the best group in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here tonight. I, I, I have to, I, there are so many acknowledgments I'd like to make. Um, <coughs> first, my dear friend, I've been talking over a year, Dave uh, and my friend Mark have been just wonderful and helping me get out here and, and just finding everything extraordinary. And then my good friend Tom and his lovely bride, Katie, <laughs> took me up at the airport. I caught them holding hands. <laughs> and they were just wonderful. We had a wonderful trip coming back uh, from uh, Cincinnati Airport. And, and, and uh, the... The whole, I think you're absolutely right. The, this has been one of the most uh, enjoyable events I've been to in a very long time. The people here are just outstanding and wonderful. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to see so many Alanons are here. <laughs> we get a lot of transfers. <laughs> but I love the Alanons. <clears throat> they, uh, they're not alcoholics, but they understand alcoholism. <clears throat> And, and it's been just this wonderful, uh, the, the, the way the, uh, it sort of just flowed, the presentations last night by Tom to, to Bob, uh, and again to Tom today on his 18th anniversary, really extraordinary. It says that this thing really works for both Bob and Tom. Today, there was just one more day, just one more day, happened to come at the end of 365. But for somebody who walked in here for the first time, it says this thing really works. And that's the, that's the golden thing of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> the power was in our experience. The power was in our collective and in our individual experience. And that experience are in these rooms. If I have an idea and you have an idea, we each have one idea. But if I give you my idea and you give me your idea, we have two ideas. And that's how it works. <clears throat> One day at a time, we share our strength and our hope and our experience so others can get well. And, and the whole notion of this service, the service that you're providing this weekend, the service that you do all year round, our recovery is spiritual. <clears throat> I think people ought to understand that going in recovery from alcoholism as we understand it is a spiritual recovery. But spirituality cannot occur in a vacuum. Spirituality must be anchored in something real. If we're going to become spiritual, we have to do something for somebody with no expectation. Bill said it a different way. We have to give it away to keep it. And that's what you've done tonight. I love to see the smiling faces of alcoholics when they're having fun. It means that God is really in his heaven. And all right with the world. <clears throat> Bill Wilson once said that no one invented Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is like a giant tapestry. If you ever look at a tapestry, on one side of it, you see a beautiful picture. But if you look behind it, you see a thousand threads going in a thousand different directions. And if you pull a thread over here, the picture will change over there. Pull a thread over here, the picture will change over there. And those thousands of threads are the members of Alcoholics Anonymous charging that happy road of destiny. And that's what we hear tonight, the beautiful tapestry of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> I have some Native American friends that I visit with from time to time, and they have a word when they come together, they say, Neitashnaka. Neitashnaka. It means the connectedness. The connectedness. It's what we have here in Alcoholics Anonymous, strong metashnika. 
And you can see it every time you see a newcomer walks into the room and his eyes lights up. And you know God's in his heaven and all bread with the world. <clears throat> you know, they say Bill Wilson was a stockbroker. <clears throat> Bill Wilson was a stock speculator. <clears throat> What he did. Bill used to sell fast talking to slow thinking people, is what Bill Wilson did. But God gave Bill a special gift. He gave Bill an extraordinary gift. He gave gift Bill the ability to look down the road and see what was happening. He could look down and see that the turmoil and the confusion and the despair that was going to come along as this movement went forward. And he left us legacies that we are we're charged with protecting. And and I think that every time I come to a gathering like this, I see that those legacies at work. Doesn't matter what happens on the outside, doesn't matter how many programs there are to deal with problems. The twelve steps, the twelve traditions, and the twelve concepts of Alcoholics Anonymous are like written in concrete and they can't ever change. And so our recovery process will never change, and it will be here for everyone. <clears throat> and I love that. I love, that. I love the story I heard one time years back. Uh, this guy died, and he went to heaven, and he came up to St. Peter's. <clears throat> St. Peter's was standing at the pearly gates. And the guy came up there, and St. Peter's asked him what his name was. He gave him his name. He says, okay, uh, we have you listed. Uh, Tell me, what religion are you? And the guy said, well, I don't have any religion. And St. Peter said, well, you have to have a religion to get into heaven. So he says, come with me. He starts down this hallway, and they open the door, and they look inside, and there's a bunch of people on their knees, and they're praying, and their heads are down. They don't look very happy. And the guy asked St. Peter, well, who are they? And he said, well, those are the Protestants. And he's the guy said, well, I don't think I want to belong to that. <laughs> And he said, not to worry. He comes down. They walked down a little, a little further down and came to another door. They opened the door, and there was a bunch of people kneeling down on their knees. They had beads, and they were praying and counting the beads. And the guy asked, well, who are they? And St. Peter says, well, they're the Catholics. And the guy said, well, I don't think I want to belong to them. So he said, come with me. They walked down the hallway, and they come to another door. And he opens the door, and they're all inside there, a bunch of people, and they're laughing and hugging and kissing and having a wonderful time. And the guy says, well, who are they? And St. Peter says, we don't know. They won't tell us. <laughs> they, they, they say they're anonymous. <laughs> I know how that guy felt. <clears throat> God is in his heaven and all's right with the world. <clears throat> When, when Bill met Ebby over his kitchen table in Brooklyn, um, the, the real, I believe, is when Alcoholics Anonymous started. Over that kitchen table in Bill's, in Bill's house. Because the problem and the solution have finally come together. <clears throat> Dr. Silkworth knew what the problem was but he had no idea what the solution was. Way over in Zurich, there was a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist named Carl Jung, had treated an alcoholic for a year. He knew what the solution was, but he didn't know what the problem was. The Oxford movement didn't know that there was a problem and that they had the solution. It wasn't until Bill and Abby met across the kitchen table that the problem and the solution finally came together. Not only that, <clears throat> Eddie brought Bill a simple program of action. And it's from that, those simple beginnings that we began here, that our message has been carried on and on and on. And I think that when Bill began to realize <clears throat> the scope and the breadth of what this could do, he began to understand what he had really accomplished. <clears throat> I've had the extraordinary good fortune to serve as a trustee on the Board of Trustees of Alcoholics Anonymous. I spent a number of many years in New York on various corporate boards. I'm an old history teacher. I taught history in high school <clears throat> while I was doing a graduate degree. And, and I got an opportunity to read a lot of Bill Wilson's writings. 
a lot of his writings that aren't even published. And Bill understood, understood alcoholics. He was a real alcoholic. He knew that he was going, he once said that the alcoholic mind was the most convoluted mind that ever came down the pipe. He wasn't going far off. And he knew that if he was going to put something together that was going to help these people live a normal, productive life, <clears throat> it had to be strange. And so he put down this simple process that we use today. It's extraordinary in its simplicity, and that was the intent of it. And so as we walk through this process, as we walk down this road, we connect the dots. We connect the dots. We set up the conditions so the change can take place. We set the dots just like a puzzle. And just like he goes through it and has peace and happiness for the rest of his life. Now the alcoholic comes down the same door, same hallway, same two doors. He walks to the door where the guy with the bat is that gets hit right in the head. Turns around, comes back down the hallway, turns around, goes right back up the hallway, same door, same guy. Walks to the door, guy hits him in the head again. Turns around, comes back down the hallway, turns around, goes up the hallway, but this time he stops. And he thinks to himself, maybe he won't be in there this time. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe I can get away with it. So he walks through the door, and the guy with the bat is gone. And the alcoholic goes looking for him. <laughs> that was me. I hit that wall 14 times and couldn't figure out what was wrong. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I come out of a neighborhood where everybody drinks. And, and it, we, people didn't trust you if you didn't drink. I was drinking when I was a little kid and never thought anything about it because everybody else was drunk. We see guys laying in the street after a Saturday night, and nobody, we stepped right over and nobody really thought much about it. Drinking was part of the community, was part of the culture. My father was an alcoholic. I didn't know he was an alcoholic. <clears throat> he was a beautiful man. I loved him dearly. He taught me how to read before I went to school. I was reading things like, like Dostoevsky and, and the Rubiats of Omar Khayyam when I was a little kid. But then he'd go out and he'd start to drink and he'd come home and nobody recognized him. He'd scream and holler and throw things and the kids would run and hide. And it wasn't until I came here that I understood <clears throat> that he couldn't help himself, that he had no choice, that he was powerless, just as I was. And, and I think that Understanding that today, look back in hindsight, I can see how so many people miss it. Just never really understand what the problem really is. It's one of the things that I loved about the way Bill wrote. He wrote so that we could understand it. <clears throat> so growing up in, in Harlem, growing up in the streets of New York, you learned a lot. You learned how to get by. <clears throat> and one of, the, one of the things that was happening the <laughs> The Korean War was breaking out, and I was still in high school, and I didn't want to get drafted. <laughs> and I did the cool, uh, the, 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 the slick thing uh, of an alcoholic. I, I, I joined the National Guard. See? I joined the National Guard in my old neighborhood. It was the oldest black military organization in those days. There was the old 369. 369 was, a, was, the, uh, was originally the 9th Calvary. The Ninth Cavalry were the old Buffalo soldiers. They rode up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. I met guys that had been drinking since they rode up San Juan Hill with, with Teddy Roosevelt. And, and, and so I got, in, I got into this office, and I spent 20 years in the military now. And but going in there, you learn an awful lot from these old timers. These old timers, they were drinkers. And they drank and drank and drank, and that, if I had to pinpoint where my alcohol is, it would have probably been right there. <clears throat> and, and so we, we drank and we got, in, got into all kinds of troubles and all kinds of difficulties. And finally, <clears throat> uh, the unit got activated, they went on active duty, and I had gone to a technical high school. And I had learned physics and electronics and math, and they sent me down to a, uh, a, a place down in Texas. Um, right on the border of, of, of Juarez, uh, El Paso, Texas, at Fort Bliss. And I 
went to school down there. Stayed down there a couple of years. Going to school, going to to uh, Nike, got in missile schools in those days. The Nikes were just coming up. But I was an alcoholic, and I got into trouble. I think, <clears throat> I'll never forget that the alcoholics can get into some of the damnedest things and never never realize how we got into them in the first place. Uh, I remember there used to be a, a drink in, in Mexico, in, in Juarez, called Oso Negro, Black Bear Gin. I'll never forget it was 44 cents a quart. <clears throat> Buddy and I had a couple of quarts of this gin wandering down the streets of Juarez, drinking um, gin bottles on the lamppost, which the Mexican police take a very dim view of. And we wound up in a Mexican jail. <clears throat> I've been in a lot of jails in my time. <clears throat> when I was a little kid, you go to the movies and you see these Earl Flynn movies, and he'd be the pirate captain, and he'd be sword fighting on the pirate ship, and and, and they catch him, and they throw him in the dungeon. And, and you see these big blocks of wood and, and chains on the wall they stick people on. I used to think that was make-believe till I got in a Mexican jail. <laughs> the thing about it, I was boxing. And I had a fight coming up. And my CEO was a fight man, fight man. And he came and he got me out. Just came and he got me out. <clears throat> and I think that's really the dilemma of the alcoholic, because we do. We get into the damnedest thing and never realize how we got out of it. I'll never forget once they asked me to leave jail. <laughs> they asked me to leave. <clears throat> the little town upstate New York, I was sitting on the curb, sucking out of a wine bottle. The police came by and said, get in. They put, took me to the, a brand new jail. They put me in a cell, and I laid down, lit a cigarette, fell asleep, and the mattress caught on fire. <laughs> they took me out of that cell, put me across the hall, another cell, laid down, lit a cigarette, the mattress caught on fire. The guy came in there and said, you have to leave. <laughs> and they put me out. I really didn't want to go. We never see ourselves the way we are. Nobody sees us. <laughs> so I, I stayed in the military. I got a lot of training, a lot of military. I taught, I taught missile systems and, and, and worked for our Army Ordnance for a while. And then the unit came back, I deactivated, and I went back to the South Bronx, <clears throat> where I grew up. And um, uh, I had a lot of good skills. I had a lot of good skills. I'm probably one of the few people who know how to arm a barometric fuse for hydrogen and warhead. They taught me how to do that. <laughs> I often wonder what happened if I was drunk one day and sitting in that console and hit the wrong button. None of us would be in here. <laughs> so I was out in the Bronx and I figured I'd get a job, but it didn't seem to be a big demand for people who knew how to arm barometric fuses <laughs> for hydrogen and warhead. So I took a test, <clears throat> and I'm a good test taker. I took a test. I wound up on the New York City Police Department. Now, I went through the academy, and when I came out, <clears throat> they put me up in Harlem, where I grew up. I knew every every dope dealer, every line, the numbers runners, the, the, the bootleggers. I knew them all. They see me coming down the street, and they be way. <laughs> I remember I locked the guy up for being drunk once. <laughs> And, and it came time to go to court. I was so drunk they had to carry me inside. <laughs> Walked the beat there for a long time, for 10 years almost. <clears throat> and, and, and about the same time, um, I started to get married. And the reason I got married was because my brother got married. <clears throat> and alcoholics marry beautiful people. You know, al will tell you that. <laughs> uh, Alcoholics marry beautiful people, <clears throat> and, 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 and I married a beautiful person, and that, as, as, as it goes, they became my, my, my uh, uh, greatest enablers. Uh, <clears throat> and, and the thing about it was that I didn't, I didn't really want to be married. I wanted to be out on the corner with the guys. I wanted to be out there drinking and going on. Uh, I, I had no, no, I wanted to be responsible, but I had no real sense of responsibility. Uh, I would come home from work, 
and, and, and my wife would have prepared a really nice meal. And, and I would walk in the house and just walk to the back and close the door and start to drink and drink and drink. And it wasn't that I didn't love my family. I loved them dearly. I had two, two boys by now, two, or two young sons, and <clears throat> I couldn't tell them I would take them to the ball game on Saturday or take them to the circuit because I knew by, that, by Saturday I'd be drunk and I wouldn't go anywhere. And so I just drank and drank and drank. <clears throat> and the bills were piling up. Uh, the job was calling me on a regular basis. <laughs> they like you to show up from time to time. And, and, and my wife needed money for the kids. And everybody was after me. I said, hate to open the mailbox. You go open the mailbox and you get these letters with the big red letters on the outside that say, pay up or die. <laughs> everybody was after me. I'll never forget one time I was going to get one alone and I pay off all the loans and pay off all the debts that I had. And, and I went, and they gave me the money. <laughs> they gave me the money. I naturally I stopped and discussed the matter with my bartender, <laughs> my financial manager. And I didn't pay anything. And, and, and it just kept getting bad, worse and worse and worse. And finally, one day, one day, and if you can do this, you can take this disease to the moon. One day, it occurred to me, it was all their fault. <laughs> it was all their fault. If they stopped asking me for money and these bill collectors would leave me alone, this job would stop calling up here, I'd be okay. And so <clears throat> I walked out of my house. I just picked up and walked out. I get sick every time I think about it till today. I had a lovely wife and lovely family. And I walked out and I wound up in one room, living in one room. <clears throat> and and uh, there's some pictures that were around the walls of A. It's on the AA meeting where a guy is sitting on the bed and two guys are trying to talk to him. <clears throat> that was me. A broken window shade and dangling light bulb, trying to find peace of mind. And finally, I couldn't even afford the room. And I wound up under the railroad trestle, sleeping under the railroad trestle. <clears throat> Drunk every day, time and time again. <clears throat> I remember I was living in a basement, sleeping in a dark, dingy basement. I'll never forget it because it, it had a burner, an automatic burner. And every time the burner would fire, I hear hallelujah chorus. <laughs> I hate the thing today. I came to in that basement one night, and I looked around, and I said, I wasn't quite drunk, and I wasn't quite sober. I looked around, and I said, what are you doing here? Why are you in this basement? I come from a good family. I got relatively good education. What are you doing in this basement? And I had no answer. <clears throat> and so I did what I always did when I got into a big jackpot. I was going to pray. And I was going to pray. When I was a little kid, they took us to court. Everybody, if, you, if your mother said you're going to church, you go to church. They took us by the hand, we went to church. And I listened very carefully <clears throat> to what the preacher said. And what I heard the preacher say was, God was somebody you could make a deal with. Yeah, you do this for me, and I'll do that for you. And it worked. Every time I got in the jackpot, get me out of this. Well, I prayed that prayer, and nothing happened. At least I thought nothing happened. What I understand today that God was right there. God hadn't gone anywhere. All I had to do was turn around and reach out. <clears throat> One of my favorite books, uh, the other big book, is the Bible. One of my favorite books in the Bible is Ecclesiastes. And the Ecclesiastics write in their book, they say, for everything there is a season and a purpose for everything under the heaven. There is a time to be born and a time to die. I believe there's a line somewhere. There is a point beyond which God will not permit us to endure pain. And we all reach that point sometime. And when some of us reach it, we die. When some of us reach it, we find our way into the rooms of alcoholics and others. But whether we die or whether we come here, God has arranged that we don't have to suffer anymore. One of my favorite writers is a man named Walter Benton. In one of his writings, he describes the alcoholic. 
He says that our days are of time and hours. And as the clock hand turns, a circle closes in upon us in a black, timeless night, sucks us in like quicksand and receives us totally, without a rain check or a parachute or a key to heaven, for a last long look. The alcoholic spirals down and down and down, and then for some inexplicable reason, God reaches in and plucks some of us out and sets us into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've long since stopped trying to understand why some of us are here and some of us are not. I know today that there's a plan. God has a plan. And we are part of that plan. And we are here by God's will. And as a result of God's will allowing us to be here, we are given the gift of sobriety and the gift of grace. And so I prayed that prayer, prayer, nothing happened. I thought nothing happened. But God moved in a very mysterious way. I had managed to hang on to my chauffeur's license, and, and I... Um, was running dumps out to uh, landfill in Staten Island. Actually, it's the same landfill they used after 9-11. In those days, it was brand new. And I was on my way back to the yard, and I blacked out. Blacked out at the wheel. Ran the truck off the road, almost out into the river. Nothing serious happened. The cops came, got the truck back up on the road, and <clears throat> uh, went to the, they suggested I go get an x-ray. And I did. I went and got the x-ray, and I left, and I didn't think any more about it. Well, the next day, I was sitting around with some of my colleagues, and we had just invested in a bottle of wine. And I got a call that says I had to go to the hospital right away. And I tried to explain to this lady, I just invested in a bottle of wine. I wasn't going nowhere. (laughs) But she said that if you don't come out, we're going to send the cops out and get you. Well, the last thing I needed was cops looking for me. Not to make a long story long, it turns out I had tuberculosis. And I had it so severely, they wouldn't let me go back home. They put me in an ambulance and they shipped me out to an isolation ward, way out on a tip in a Staten Island, a place called Seaview Hospital. And I spent the next year and a half out there. And I realized today that was God moving in my life. It may seem strange that getting a serious disease like tuberculosis was a good thing, but for me it was. While I was in the hospital, <clears throat> I had everything done for me. Uh, I, I was in bed all the time. You couldn't get out. They even took you to the bathroom in a wheelchair. So the, for the whole time I was in the hospital, I had nothing more to do but to stop and think and look back over my life. And I saw... Every single time that I got into any difficulty, any time I went to jail or lost a job or got into a fight, any time something bad happened, I was either drinking or I was drunk. From the time I was a little kid, and I think it was in the, in the, in the hospital that this state of grace entered in my head, and this cement block up here lifted. And the message went through and said, there's something wrong with you. And it has to do with alcohol. Well, I got to tell you, nobody came running down the hallway with a donut and a cup of coffee. He said, we got an AA meeting here. What happened was the supervising nurse on my ward was one of you sneaky people. (laughs) (laughs) And she was watching my shenanigans the whole time I was in there. I was running games in the hospital just like I did out in the street. And that was the day before uh, I was to be discharged. I was sitting on the side of the bed, and she came by, and she saw me, and she came over and asked me what, what, the, what, the mess, what was wrong, what was the matter. And so I think for the first instant, as I look back over it, for grace really entering in my life, I said I was afraid. I was afraid to go back out in the street. While I was in the hospital, I was in a protected environment. I had everything I needed. Everything that I needed was done for me right there. And I knew the moment I stepped outside the door, I'd be, I'd be in that rat race again. I'd be just like Alice in Wonderland, running twice as fast to stay exactly where I was. 
And I told him I was afraid. And she asked me the question that we all get asked in one form or another. She said, do you really want help? And I said, yes. Again, grace coming into my life. I really need help. And so she arranged for me to get to my first day hey, meeting. I got to tell you, I got sober down on the south shore of Staten Island, a place called Brick Hill. Have anybody ever heard of it? The John Birch Society started on the south shore of Staten Island. See? And they got people that live on the south shore of Staten Island that think the John Birch Society are liberals. I walked into the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I knew there was something wrong right away. <clears throat> the first thing, there was no black people in there. The other thing that was really strange, this was February. And there were guys sitting in that meeting with white shoes on in the winter time. They don't wear white shoes in the summertime in Spanish Harlem. I said, these are some very strange people. I was on my way out the door, <clears throat> and a guy walked up to me, and he showed me this blue book. He said, everything that you will ever need is in this book. Well, my scheme in mind went right to work. If everything I need is in this book, I'll read this book and figure out how to get a loan off these people. <laughs> when I came out of that hospital, everything I owned, I carried out of there in a, in a, in a shopping bag, and that had a hole in it. <laughs> I'll, I'll figure out how to get some money from these folks. So I took that book, and I read, I read that book from cover to cover. <clears throat> and I came back about a week later. And I went up to him. His name was Ellie Andrews. God bless him. He died when I was about 15 years old. And I miss him today. I used to call him my walking stick. I walked up to Ellie and I said, Ellie, I can't get a loan out of this book. And he said, yes, you can. And you know he was right. I must have read that book a hundred times by now. And I can, I can still find answers to questions that I need reading the book today. <clears throat> and so what he said to me was, <clears throat> I'm going to be your sponsor because you don't have brains enough to get one. <clears throat> and, and I don't know why. He was a little guy. I came up to about here with me, but he, he looked you right in the eye. You know, he would tell me on a regular basis the three words you never want to hear an alcoholic say is, I've been thinking. <laughs> so he said, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to walk through this recovery process, and I'm going to explain to you what he did. And I think that it was that, that process and that approach that saved my life. He didn't try to force anything on me. He explained every single thing we did and explained it in terms that I could understand. He said when Bill wrote step one, he wanted people to know what was wrong with him. That's why he wrote it. He wanted to keep it very simple. You are powerless over alcohol. Your lives are un unmanageable. Simple statement. I see people trying to figure out stuff and analyze powerlessness and figure out unmanageability. He used to say that trying to figure out powerlessness is like sitting in a rocking chair. It won't get, get you no place, but it'll give you something to do. <laughs> you are powerless over alcohol. That's why you're here. He said, now, if you know that you're powerless and that's a problem, what you need to do is find a power. Rule step two. Come to believe that there's a power greater than yourself that can restore you to sanity. That's what he wanted you to know. <clears throat> we originally had a six-step program. It came out of the Oxford movement. And we had something called the absolutes. And Bill had written it, and the people had gotten sober. They used to have what was called the Oxford squad of the of the uh, uh, Oxford movement. And there were people that had gotten sober. And Bill went to those people. And he, write, he writes about them in the beginning of our book. We are 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And the purpose of this book is to tell other alcoholics precisely how we did it. Well, he went to those people. Incidentally, it wasn't 100. <laughs> it was 40, 50. Bill was, he would took a little license at time to time. He went to them and he asked them what had happened. And they said, we did these steps and now we know. There is a power 
created in ourselves that can restore us to sanity because it happened to us. Now I know what the problem is. I have no power. I know what the solution is. Find the power. All I need now is a direction to go. You go to step three. Make a decision. Turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understood him. It's simple as that. And for people like me, he wrote a very simple prayer. My creator, I give myself to thee, to do with me as I will. Remove from me the bondage of myself so that victory over my difficulties will bear witness of their love, dishonor, and your way of life. And all I had to do was accept that and move on. So now I know what the problem is. I have no power. I know what the solution is. Find the power. And now I have a direction to go. Step four. I'm setting up the conditions now. I'm connecting the dots. Then he said, <clears throat> what we need is to look at yourself. He said, if we're going to change, the first thing you have to know is, what do you need to change? You go to step four. Make a statement and fail as well. Well, moral inventory of yourself. Look at you. Who are you? Find out who that is. And he wrote this out in a way that I couldn't play tricks in my head. I wrote it out exactly. <clears throat> I never met an alcoholic yet who didn't know exactly who they were mad at. <laughs> or who they hated or who, who they had sex with. They knew them all. <laughs> So now I wrote them all down. I know what this is with her. I know who I am. Not only that, I had to go tell somebody else. I had to tell somebody else. Uh, at the time I was ready to do the fifth step, I went on a retreat. Uh, Ellie had broken his hip and was out in Minnesota getting a hip replacement. And so I did a, 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 my fifth step with a priest on a retreat. His name was Father John, this beautiful man. <clears throat> and after I read him this 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 missive from St. Paul. He asked me, he said, do you want to stay that person or do you want to change? It's up to you. And, and I looked back and I got some valuable information from that, that whole idea. For the first time, I realized that I was a liar and a thief and dishonest, and I had been for a very long time. And I couldn't deny it. That's who I was. <clears throat> Then he says, <clears throat> all you have to do is ask. Humbly ask. I got ready and I was prepared to change. He told the story and I love it. He says that a farmer can't grow anything. What the farmer does is sets up the conditions. He can plant the seeds and water the soil. He sets the conditions so the change can take place. God will make the plants grow. A doctor can't heal anybody. He sets up the condition. He can diagnose the illness, prescribe the medication. He sets the conditions so the change can take place. God will heal a patient. We can't change anything, but we can set the conditions so the change can take place. All we have to do is become ready and willing and then ask God to do it for us. And he wrote another prayer. Simple prayer. My creator, I give myself to thee, do with me as thou will. Remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Well, I said that prayer. <clears throat> and I thought at the very least I ought to get a halo or a pair of wings or something. And I went back to Ellie and I told him, I said, I said that prayer. He said, go back and read it again. And then I read it again and I realized the essence of the prayer was, remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellow. If I'm going to become <clears throat> whole, if I'm going to become useful, <clears throat> I have to do something for somebody with no expectation. Bill said it a different way. We have to give it away to keep it. And the essence of our recovery process is service. 
And in service, we give and we get back. We reach out and we get back. And so I began to understand, and this change was happening, and I didn't realize that the change was happening. Looking back in hindsight, I began to see, I became less skeptical, I became more truthful. <clears throat> uh, I began to understand the value of prayer and understanding that there is a power that could do for me what I couldn't do for myself. I had a really good example of that <clears throat> early on. When I first came, before I came to Maryland, I was a general contractor, and I used to do a lot of federal stuff, HUD retrofits, uh, ADA retrofits, uh, <clears throat> in housing projects. And normally, if you have, I had a lot of contracts to bid out, and uh, normally, if you have a contract oh, under a certain amount, you don't have to bid it. You can give it to the most responsible contract. Well, I had a small contract, and a guy came to me, and he said, he asked me if he could have the contract, and he gave me the story about his wife being sick and his business not doing well. So I gave him the contract. A little while later, he came back to me and said he didn't have any money to buy materials. So I fronted him the money to buy the materials. And the guy stiffed me. Took off with my money. I couldn't find him. I went to his house. I went to his office. I could not find this guy anywhere. <clears throat> I have some friends of mine that live up in Brooklyn and Flatbush in New York. They specialize in kneecap. <laughs> I was going to get a couple of my friends to speak to him, seriously. At the very least, I was going to back one of my cement trucks up to his house and fill up his living room. <laughs> I made the mistake of telling my sponsor what I was going to do. And he said, no, you have to pray for him. Well, I thought that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. You do not pray for people who steal your money where I come from. But I had been with this guy for about a year, and everything he told me happened to come out right. So I said, okay, I'm going to pray for this guy. You should have heard this prayer. Listen, God, I'm going to pray for this SOB. I hope he have a heart attack. <laughs> I prayed that prayer, I don't know, maybe six, eight weeks or so. And then one day, it was like somebody pulled a string out of an orange. That knot in my gut was gone. Absolutely gone. And I'll never forget because about a year later, I was having lunch with another contractor, and he said, you know that guy that stiffed you for that money last year? I said, yeah. He said, you know he had a heart attack and died? <laughs> I said, I was praying for that guy. <laughs> he looked me right in the eye and said, please, don't never pray for me. <laughs> True story. The thing about that, I learned some valuable lessons from it. Be very careful what you pray for. <laughs> for one thing, when God really wants to punish you, he will answer your prayer. <laughs> and when you pray, there is always a result. Always a result. <clears throat> and so we started going on, and things were moving well, going along very well. And, and I was learning well in the, in the process. My, my mother had gotten cancer, uh, and, and she got sick and died, and I was able to take care of her. I took her into one of my, one of my buildings I owned and, and took care of her for the whole time. And I remember once she was going into the operating room, um, <clears throat> I held her by the hand and told her I loved her. And she came up not too long after that, and she passed. And what was amazing, the, the, the funeral home, was where we were having a service, it was packed, literally packed. And I remember my aunt D looking around like, who are all these people? <laughs> I said, those are just friends of mine. Unbelievable. <clears throat> and, and, and then, not too long after that, while I was in the hospital, my wife got cancer, and she died. And my two sons were in foster care. And I'll never forget... I was going. I was. I was talking to Ellie. I said, "I want to get my two boys back." And Ellie told me the same thing. He said, "Be careful what you pray for." 
because I got them back. Two boys, <clears throat> teenagers, and I, I really spent the next 10 years raising them. Uh, and I got to tell you, they are, they are two beautiful young men today. They're both in AA. They're both police officers. <laughs> and, and so <clears throat> I'll never forget one day, I, uh, we were at our group uh, monthly business meeting, and I went out to the bathroom, and when I came back, I was the GSR. I didn't know what a GSR was. I had no idea what was a GSR. Well, Ellie said, not to worry. <laughs> and he gave me the service manual. I tell you, anytime you can't fall asleep, get a service manual. <laughs> I became a GSR, and then I became the first district uh, committee member on Staten Island. Ever. We only had seven meetings in the whole county. I was a DC, the first DCM in Staten Island. And then one day, I get a call from my service sponsor. Her name was Jackie. Jackie saw Actually, she was Bill Wilson's secretary for a while. She calls me up and says, there's a vacancy on the World Services Corporate Board. Send in your resume. Well, I really didn't want to do it. But you don't argue with Jackie, so I did. The next thing you know, <laughs> I'm a director on the AA World Services Corporate Board. <laughs> As a matter of fact, for a while, I was chairman of the board. That's <laughs> me. AA World Services is where all your money goes. <laughs> when you put it in the basket, <laughs> and, and, and it goes up to AA World Services, and I was me handling all your money. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> and I got began to really understand the breadth and scope of alcoholics anonymous. And then four years later, I was elected as a trustee on the board of trustees of alcoholics anonymous, and I began to travel. For AA, all over the world, and in a lot of, lot of places in the world, I've never, I haven't been. It was an extraordinary experience. <clears throat> uh, I was, I was telling Tom, and when we were driving back, I uh, would, went to uh, Glasgow, Scotland, to the World Services Conference, and uh, my host there was a guy uh, who owned a bar. <laughs> he owned a bar, and he owned two Rolls Royces. And, and, and when I pulled up and I flew into Glasgow and he picked me up and he asked me if I'd like to go on a 12-step call. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I would. And uh, he picked me up and we drove out to St. Andrews. I don't know if anybody ever been out to St. Andrews Golf Club. It is fabulous, unbelievable, huge estates around here. And we pull up in front of this estate and we go inside. And here's this guy crawling around the floor, drunk as a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, he had thrown up, they puked just like we do. <laughs> Turns out this guy was a member of Parliament. <laughs> but we gathered him up, Ray and I gathered him up, and he took us. I went down to Polk at, uh, at, at Ireland's 50th anniversary, took him with us down there, all the way down, down the Black Pool Lane. And uh, uh, kept him for about a week. He just followed us around. And I don't know today whether or not that guy is still sober, <clears throat> but it was one of the most extraordinary experiences I had over and over and over. Another time, we were having a regional forum in Bethesda. And uh, it was at the time the Berlin Wall came down, back in the early 90s, and, and uh, everybody was so excited. The big book was going into, into countries like Lit Latvia and Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, and everybody was happy to... The, the, the big book was traveling to all these eastern countries. <clears throat> and uh, the guy that was running the, the forum has said, is there anybody got any questions? And the guy in the back stood up, and he said, how many of our books have been translated into the African language of Swahili? It got quiet there as it did in here. <laughs> None. We didn't have one. But to tell you, our, our staff in New York had been corresponding with a priest in Kenya. And he had translated the big book into Swahili. And he uh, sent us the, the translation, and we edited it. And not to make a long story longer, uh, about a, a year later, the first copy of the big book of Alcoholics and Swahili came off the presses. And the guy that asked the question, his name was Abango, he asked me if I would speak at his 10th anniversary. 
and, and I did. And I was able to give him the first copy of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in Swahili. It was the dedication of our staff and the people in New York that put that together. And we began to see the scope and the breadth of Alcoholics Anonymous all over the world. <coughs> I, uh, I can't begin to tell you how important Alcoholics Anonymous is to me and has been for so many years. <coughs> Um, I left it after I came off the police force. I, got, I went back to school and got a couple of degrees, and I became a general contractor. Uh, I started building houses for people that, that could afford them. Um, I went down to, came down to Maryland and began to manage, assisted in public housing, and began building houses around the country. Uh, every, every time... I go into a new community. I start a little program. I coach boxers. I coach Olympic boxers, and and I, I teach kids how to box and get them off the street, get them into the gym. And I've been doing that for a very long time. <clears throat> and and so my life has become extraordinary full. And 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 I love to travel around and talk to people and hear how AA works in other places. Because I know that God's in this heaven and all is right with the world. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. doesn't matter what your, your, your legal status is, what your gender, color. If you walk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and you say you have a problem with alcohol, you got to see that at the table. And I found that everywhere I went. <clears throat> I go up to a sweat lodge <clears throat> in a place called Minot, North Dakota. There's a tribe of Chippewa, and, and their, their sweat lodge is on a place called Turtle Mountain. And they're known as the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. And um, the first time you go into a sweat lodge, you have to carry a, a, a rock to a fire pit with no clothes on. <laughs> yeah. So I'm walking down this aisle. I'm on this sweat lodge, walking down, carrying this rock. An old elder in the back stood up. And he pointed to me, and he said, Numa. And I learned later on it meant bear. A little later on, another elder got up and pointed to me and said, Numa ha. And I understood that that means walking bear. And that became my name. Uh-oh. <laughs> Black elk is watching me. <clears throat> Became my name, New Mark Hall, the walking bear. And while I was there, they told a story about the wounded healer. And the wounded healer is the Indian spirit. He doesn't do anything until a warrior is wounded. And when a warrior is wounded, the spirit appears in front of him and he opens his cloak and he has a wound exactly like the warrior. And the warrior looks at the at the the, the spirit's wound. And he gets healed. And the first time I heard that story, I said, that's what we do. That's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Every time we share our strength and our hope and our experience, we show somebody our wounds and they get healed. So we are all wounded healers. One of my favorite pamphlets is a pamphlet called Mem A Member's Eye View. It's, it's, it's one of my favorites, required reading for all my pigeons. <clears throat> and one of the things he says in the pamphlet is that nothing that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous is new. Everything that we do is as old as time itself. The reason the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous work are because they are true principles. And they will work for anyone, anywhere, anytime. And I understand today, it is what has me today understanding who I am and what I am. There's not a lot of people in the world that can say who they are, unequivocally and without any question. I'm an alcoholic. I know exactly what that means. It tells me what I can do. It tells me what I can't do. It gives me parameters that I need to live by. And I learned that coming into the rooms of AA and sitting down and listening. 
toward the end of that pamphlet, the, uh, the writer takes kind of a biblical turn. And he talks about the time that John the Baptist was once again in Herod's prison for about the hundredth time. And while John was in prison, he heard about his cousin, Jesus. And Jesus was about the land doing all kinds of miraculous things. <clears throat> and John called two of his followers to him, and he said, Go and find Jesus and ask Jesus if he is the Messiah. Ask Jesus if he's the one we've been waiting for. <clears throat> well, the men went out, and they found the Lord, and they walked with him for a while. And then one day they asked him, Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for? And Jesus didn't answer them directly. What he said was, go back to John and tell John only what you have seen and only what you have heard. Tell John that the blind can see and the deaf can hear and the lame can walk and the poor in spirit have been given the good news. Well, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I can report to you today if you'll accept it. I know for a fact that the blind can see and the deaf can hear and the lame can walk, and the foreign spirits have been given the good news. Alcoholics Anonymous is here for each and every one of them. God bless you. Thank you.